I, as, uh, as uh, indicated already, mostly I will probably present in English because même que je parle français, je n'ai pas le vocabulaire euh, technique pour présenter les détails de, de ce qu'on ce qu appelle. Alors, euh, je vais juste vous raconter notre histoire. Uh, uh, it's a little bit like a case study, um, or will be when we finally get to the end of the project. But I want before to before talking about the project itself, just to show you a little bit about what is Athabasca University. It is a unique institution in Canada. It is an, a distance education. Uh, institution primarily. It is an open university, which makes it even more unique in terms of its um, uh, mission to reduce barriers for students from underrepresented populations of students who can't get to traditional face-to-face -face classrooms. Um, we uh, uh, allow uh, our uh, open uh, registration which means that students can register every month for, for uh, online individualized study courses. There are a few paced courses at the graduate level, but otherwise students are studying more or less on their own. And uh, you can come into Athabasca University without even a high school diploma as long as you are 16 years old target primarily um, part-time learners, um, older learners, people who have stopped out of the education system or who have college diplomas and are looking to complete degrees. So while having said all that, we also belong to a categorization of universities in Alberta, which is called CARI, the Comprehensive Academic and research institutions. So we are a fully fledged university in the traditional sense in terms of our um, existence as well. Athabasca University was created in 1970 and its first course was delivered in 1973 to 75 as a pilot project. It was a face-to-face -face course but this is, you can see from the picture, this is where we're located, in the Boreal Forest in northern Alberta, about two hours north of Edmonton, which is the capital of Alberta. And um, we are, not, while we're not remote, we're certainly rural. Uh, world ecology was a great way to start. Um, in 1984, the university, which had originally been established in Edmonton, moved to Athabasca, the community of Athabasca, which is a community of no more than 3,000 people. So, uh, but it is, what we are a virtual university in the sense that we have no students on campus at all. We are completely distance education. Many of our staff and faculty um, work from home offices, so in that sense, we are virtual as well. We were allowed to offer doc, uh, master's programs as of 1992, and our first doctoral program, the education doctorate, um, began in 2006. Since then, we've added another doctoral program, many more master's programs. We also are accredited in the US by the Middle State Commission on Higher Education, which allows us um, well, it does two things for us. It allows us to attract students from the U.S., but it also, um, uh, the accreditation process is a very good um, standards and quality assessment process that allows the university to show um, uh, its students and its uh, partners that we are completely legitimate from a, from a university perspective that distance education indeed is not second class education. This is our new building, which is a center for teaching and research, also on the campus that I showed you before. 
And as of last year, we also offer a program in architecture, which is unique in the country and probably in the world. Um, uh, teaching architecture at a distance is, uh, is a very unusual process. So Athabasca has a history of having pioneered a number of distance education, open education, and technology-enhanced education initiatives. So the eText initiative I'm going to talk to you about today is another one of those. We are, so far, the only university that has done a university-wide initiative of this sort, although there are some examples in the college sector, um, Algonquin College in Ottawa, for example. Uh, uh, just a description of how many staff we have, about 1,105, as of, and uh, how many are academic. This is academic full-time, academic part-time, part-time tutors and markers, our professional staff, management, and executive, very few of those. It's a very flat organization and uh, a very devoted organization. Almost everybody who works at Athabasca University cares deeply about the mission of reducing barriers to students. At the graduate level, the dark blue is the number of our registered students. At the undergraduate level, the light blue bars are the, the numbers of our undergraduate students on an annual basis for somewhere around 40,000 students a year, increasing in recent years but flattening out. This year we have seen a decline in our uh, enrollments. These would be the number of enrollments closer to 72 to 75,000 registrations in individual courses a year. So I'm hoping that these two slides give you a sense of the scope and size of the university. We have about 900 courses, about 90 programs, about and, and so these large numbers of students as well. We don't see them at all, um, except some of them at convocation when they graduate. The university offers a large number of different flexible op uh, options for taking courses. Um, as I've said, individualized study, some graduate study. We have a brand new um, laboratory with remote e equipment that can be controlled at a distance. Um, a lot of different technologies used on a pilot basis in, var in various courses. Um, but just to um, demonstrate that our uh, learning management system is Moodle and we use as much as possible open source softwares in the various programs that we offer. Um, as a learning management system, Moodle does quite a lot of different things for us and it has been customized to our particular environment. We offer a lot of different kinds of support for students through the library, which has a very large collection of um, e-books and subscriptions to, to online journals and a lot of open educational resources. We have orientation, training, support at various levels. Our as, as services for students with disabilities is very highly used because we have a much larger than traditional population of distance students, given that uh, students, for example, with this physical disabilities um, who have trouble coming on campus, getting onto, into traditional uh, universities, are very comfortable studying at home using the online environment. So we have most of the same counseling services that universities would have, other than things like physical education, parking, um, uh, health services, and so on. But we offer uh, a, a good uh, cross-section of services to help students. Our students are located about, uh, about 
40% in Alberta, about 40% from Ontario, and the other, uh, the remaining from across Canada and around the world. We don't have a very large number of students outside of Canada. Most of them are Canadians who live in other countries. But um, that is a growing market. The Ontario uh, student population is declining as Ontario moves into online education in a more sophisticated way as well, which is a challenge for the university for sure. So with that context, I'd like to give you just a, uh, the history, maybe the story of our eText initiative. So I've described that we are uh, an online university. Uh, it was in 2002 when the university stated for the first time in its strategic plan that we would be moving into the online world and away from correspondence education, print-based uh, education that was our beginning. Um, Athabasca University is funded mostly on tuition dollars, uh, not very completely uh, by the government uh, as compared to other universities. A very low proportion of our revenues come from government funding. And as a result, with government control of tuition, as, um, as technologies have increased and as costs have risen, uh, particularly around the cost of learning resources, such as published textbooks, uh, we've been feeling some very serious budget pressures. Um, and indeed, finding places to cut costs without cutting quality has been a very major part of our initiative in the last several years. We had some faculty in various um, disciplines who were using e-textbooks in individual courses. But there were some very serious constraints that uh, limited the success of those initiatives. While publishers were telling faculty that e-texts were a good uh, um, option for students, publishers' um, uh, licenses for access to e-texts or their rental agreements didn't match at all with our ongoing enrollment. So if you want to take a course at Athabasca, you can register by the 10th of this month, which is just next week, and you can start that course in December. We don't work on a semester base, but the publishers' relationships were all semester based, and they were not willing on, individu on an individual basis to make changes to those arrangements. This made it almost impossible for our students to be successfully supported by e-texts in, in, in the earliest days. The e-text initiative was designed so partly for cutting the costs of textbooks, which had been rising at the rate of 46% a year for the last dozen years. Um, we don't charge students for textbooks and other print-based learning resources. They pay a tuition fee plus what we call a learning resources fee. That learning resources fee has been stable for a number of years at $180 per course. The, the fee was originally designed to cover the cost of textbooks plus um, the cost, some costs related to the technology that we use, costs for copyright licenses, um, in the library, and also database subscriptions and online journal access through the library. But as you probably know, textbooks have been rising uh, in cost, and $180 doesn't cover the cost of an accounting textbook, for example, or an anatomy textbook, as another example. And so we were not uh, breaking even on that model of funding our learning resources. As a result, we initiated this approach to e-texts as a cross-functional executive supported project. The, pres the vice president of uh, finance and administration, the vice president of inf uh, information and communication, our VP 
CIT and our CIO Chief Information Officer, as well as the Vice President of Academic um, for co-sponsoring the initiative. And the uh, entire um, activity was uh, led by the Associate Vice President Academic, who is actually me right now, as well as being Vice President Academic. But I was not the Associate or the VP at the time when the initiative started. Still in all, I have been personally responsible for um, uh, making sure that it has been a success um, from almost the beginning of the project. Our initiative was limited to um, the four major publishers in Canada who support our uh, courses. McGraw-Hill, Nelson, Pearson, and Wiley together uh, supply about 80% of the learning resources for our 900 courses. And so uh, this was a major potential cost saving if we could reduce the costs of those learning resources with these three major publishers. We began negotiations with the publishers uh, about 18 months ago to see if they were interested in setting up conditions under which uh, Athabasca University students would be more successful with e-text courses. And indeed, that's what we were able to do, negotiating perpetual access, uh, that is permanent access, for our students to the e-textbooks rather than this uh, semester-based access that is more typical across the country. These four publishers all use VitalSource, which is a US-based uh, digital platform for the delivery of their e-texts. And, um, uh, and so we went, we uh, negotiated with the publishers to also use this same technology. VitalSource allows highlighting searching, commenting, uh, a whole host of other kinds of interactive capabilities with a textbook um, that we thought would be an advantage, a pedagogical advantage for our students. Um, these uh, four publishers have, since we began these negotiations, pretty much all moved into their own digital platforms as well, and you may or may not be Familiar with some of those digital platforms. I know that at least some of these publishers produce textbooks for in French, um, but I don't know what that what their capability is there. Um, we wanted to have a single environment, just like you have a single environment in your learning management system for students so that they are comfortable across their courses. We wanted a single environment for the e-texts as well, and so that also explains the partnerships that we um, negotiated. And the conditions under which we moved into this e-text initiative were quite clear. Without uh, agreement, we would not have moved forward. The uh, conditions, other conditions under which we established this uh, initiative included um, that the text, the, uh, one textbook per course was necessary. We were not able to accommodate courses that had a textbook, more than one textbook in its course, or uh, textbooks from more than one publisher. Just because we wanted to keep the, um, the pilot project as simple as possible. Um, Courses had to have their text, their textbook published by one of these four major publishers. Now there are probably 30 other publishers represented in the other 20% of our courses, and most of them are not large enough or were, did not have capacity for e-texts. Um, it was just so much easier to focus on these larger numbers. Um, we also uh, wanted to uh, begin the conversion to e-text 
with a course as it was being converted from a paper-based correspondence version to an online course version. We, out of those 900 courses, we still have probably 150 that are strictly paper. Um, we are completing the conversion to online um, as courses go into revision rather than conversion. We're talking about redesign of our courses for the online learning environment. Um, so when, uh, when we had uh, stockpiles or inventories on site of paper-based textbooks or paper-based course manuals and study guides, um, we didn't want to change that format until we ran out of stock. Um, courses that were already in revision were not part of our project because they were in the middle of being redesigned. We wanted courses that were completely ready to be delivered. Um, they had to be in Moodle, and the version of Moodle that we are using currently is 2.2. When we get to the next version of Moodle, we will have completed all of our online um, transition, but that is in the next six months or so. The, uh, at, in the middle of this e-text initiative was a conversion from Moodle 1.97 to Moodle 2.2. So our courses, the, this is because the integration with VitalSource and the integration with the publishing companies um, required at a minimum Moodle 2.2. Initially, we conceived of the project as only being um, uh, at the undergraduate level. But what happened uh, along, uh, along the way is that there were some graduate courses with, that met all of the other parameters for the project. And they wanted to partake. They wanted to be a part of this project as well. And I'll show you in a minute how, how the conversion happened over time. This was initiated as a cross-university consultative project. We established an advisory group that was representative of all the key stakeholders in the university. The advisory group first met in March of 2013 and met monthly after that, continued to do that until just recently, actually. Um, the advisory group helped share the story in the various stakeholder groups, helped us design um, a better product, I would say, helped us design the conditions under which we moved forward. Um, we created this website, which you can go visit at any time, but I'm not going to link to right now, which gives a list and gave a schedule for the conversion of various courses. It had FAQs, uh, frequently asked questions for uh, tutors and faculty and students so that they could have their first uh, questions about the initiative answered. It became the clearinghouse for all of the information that needed to be shared with people moving forward. We also launched a discussion forum in a, uh, an Athabasca proprietary um, social network that we have called The Landing. It's a social network that is completely um, safe from a university perspective and secure. It is, and it was, and it became, and still is the largest of our internal discussion forums, with more than 125 members um, contributing feedback about the plans as we went forward. This is really quite important to us because Athabasca University does have a history, like many do, of implementing technologies without broad consultation in advance. And, or, and where that's felt by faculty and staff to be an imposition um, from the leadership without careful consideration. We really wanted this project to be carefully integrated into the thinking and, and the teaching and learning processes of the university. So, so many departments across the university were used. The student service departments I've referred to, the academic departments, the various disciplines, the, the dean's offices, the vice president's offices in all of the different areas. Um, 
the impact on workloads was thought through in advance so that people didn't get overly stressed by the change in technology. It's interesting how a change in technology can cause people to become paralyzed in their other work. It's, it's a difficult, uh, what I call a hot button issue for people who are already feeling overloaded. And most universities, I assume yours as well, people are feeling overloaded as budgets get cut and, and, and so on. We tried to communicate regularly as much as possible. And um, while you'll see in the feedback that some people thought we didn't do as great a job as could have been done, we certainly did a pretty good job. And, and we are happy with our success in that regard. The faculties, we have four faculties at Athabasca. And all four of them were involved in this initiative. So that also helped. Um, it made it larger than most pilot projects are, but it allowed people in each of the disciplines to experiment with the options and, and advantages of the e-text environment. So we began in October of 2013 with the conversion of just less than 20 courses. This graph shows the cumulative number of courses, up to about 127 converted as of, uh, of September 2014. The orange on the top is the number of courses that were converted in each month as compared to the number of courses that were existing. You can see that in July, for example, in June, which is a very busy vacation month and convocation month, there was less work done to convert courses than at other times of the year, particularly at the beginning. Over time, these 127 courses have resulted in almost 30,000 registrations being impacted. So that's 30, not 30,000, well, 30,000 students but a student might be in more than one course. So this is 30,000 registrations by September uh, were using uh, e-texts as opposed to print-based texts. Now, just a, a clarification on that. The, we gave students the option of purchasing the print-based text if they wanted to. And we gave them access to publisher websites for reduced prices to do that. So a student who didn't like or wasn't comfortable or successful with the online version of their textbook uh, was able to purchase uh, a print-based copy. Um, this was both good and bad, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, to begin with some of the feedback that we've gotten from students and from instructors, the very, the very biggest problem I think that we faced in, in the grand scheme of things is that we did not reduce that learning resources fee of $180 per course. Students and professors both expected that we would. And in fact, as the leader of the project, I argued um, very loudly at budget committee meetings for us to do that so that we could uh, give evidence to the university community that we cared about student costs. However, the university is in such a difficult financial strait that it was decided not to reduce the fees. And I think that was a bad decision. And the students and the professors also believe it was a bad decision. Um, as a result of that, the anger and frustration that that caused caused us some uh, serious uh, reason for pause about how we would uh, move further ahead in this pilot project. And as of last fall, I said, we are not converting any more courses into e-text courses until we have the results of a formal formative evaluation, which gives us guidance and direction for how we might move forward on this with more than the 130 courses. Um, 
there weren't, uh, the students uh, and professors felt that there wasn't enough choice. In spite of our attempts at communication, they would have liked to have been able to say they didn't want to decide. I, I guess I should make it clear that it was decided uh, administratively which courses would go into e-text. If they fit the criteria, then they went in, and a professor did not have the ability to say no to that. Uh, they didn't like that very much, and I understand why. Uh, but we didn't have, we just, this is the way we decided that we would do it. There was some confusion with respect to access codes. Um, you may know that e-texts provided by publishers now often come with access codes to the publisher website. And there was con some confusion uh, with respect to publisher resources versus resources in vital source and so on um, that we didn't anticipate because we didn't know that the publishers were providing um, extra access to publisher websites with quite the same frequency as it turned out that they were. Um, there was also some confusion with the publishers with respect to who would answer what questions. So the resources for assistance whether they came from within Athabasca or whether they came from the publisher. There was some confusion there. Um, some of the challenges that we faced, um, I've just referred to. That's what I mean by resource supplementaire. Keys is the, um, the website, uh, publisher websites. For example, databases of questions and exercises and so on. Some of our faculty were using these resources, but it wasn't known to our course materials management staff that these expectations were uh, made of students. And so that was a real challenge getting around that. The um, uh, and digital assets is the term that's used by publishers to refer to these publisher-based websites. The digital competencies of faculty, students, and staff were in some cases not at the level for them to be comfortable with the e-text environment. The um, arrangements with vital source also imposed limits on the amount of printing that students can do. In some cases, the limit was one chapter at a time. In some cases, it was, it was 10 pages at a time. And those limits were very frustrating for students who didn't want to buy a print copy of the book but wanted to print portions of it. Um, I've referred a little bit already to the, the direct link between publishers and students. Publishers don't deal with students very well in a direct way. Uh, that's why they sell their uh, materials through bookstores and in our case through a course materials production environment. So there were some errors, some complications, some issues of um, uh, conversion from Canadian to American currency and back. The publisher's websites weren't quite as user-friendly or as student-friendly as we would have liked. Uh, and in a, a few cases, the text, the e-text itself wasn't actually the right version um, for some reason, the publisher transmitted the wrong file to Vital Source, and it turned out that Vital Source would have was a different version of the of the textbook that was used in our course. So you know that publishers change their uh, editions from time to time, and we might have designed a course with a textbook that was the uh, version three or edition three, but say a 2009 edition, but the the, the version of the, of the book that was sent to Vital Source for our arrangement turned out to be version 4, which was a 2012 edition, as an example. That was quite complica complicated and confusing for some of the students. Some of the um, commentary, the highlighting, and so on in the interactive version of Vital Source um, was not consistent from online version to uh, downloaded version. And these were some technical things that the publishers were not aware of either, and I believe uh, everybody is addressing. So in a pilot project, you run into um, technical difficulties quite frequently. So we decided we would have a formal formative evaluation, as I've said, and that was conducted by our Office of Institutional Studies, 
so that we weren't uh, compromising the results of our um, pilot project by doing the evaluation ourselves. That is, those of us who were responsible for launching the project aren't, weren't doing our own uh, evaluation. Um, institutional studies use quite a lot of different methods. Um, they reviewed all of the documents, the emails, the communications, uh, the website, everything that was collected over the 18 months. They did interviews with key informants in the student group, in staff groups, in um, faculty and tutor groups. They did an online survey. They've done some studies, uh, some case studies, and we are still waiting for the collection of publisher data about uh, student behaviors and activities within the um, online uh, e-text environment. So far, we've completed a quant the quantitative analysis of um, uh, the behaviors of students and the quantitative analysis of the survey, the self-report survey. Um, we've looked at how many, we've looked at withdrawal rates. And there is some evidence that uh, courses with e-texts in them have ha had higher withdrawal rates than regular courses. This is obviously of some concern. We did have some students say um, quite bluntly and directly to us that they would not take another course with an e-text because they didn't like it. We're trying to get it a, a, now at an understanding of who was more successful with the e-text environment, whether there are demographic factors or disciplinary factors. 21 interviews were uh, done, and we're just waiting now for an analysis of the results of those individual interviews. Um, you are looking in the interviews for factors influencing the adoption of an e-text on the part of students and on the part of faculty. We were looking for um, feedback on the effectiveness of our preparation and of the implementation of the project. And we were looking for a better understanding of the technical problems that might have um, arisen and also the potential that people felt for the future. Uh, the biggest concerns that we've identified so far is the lack of ability to choose. In fact, our student associations have been extremely clear about the fact that they don't really want us to be providing e-textbooks or print textbooks. They want us to design courses where the student has the choice of what kind of learning materials they want or they can use. In other words, they want students to be able to decide whether they want to study from print or in the online world or some combination. They want students to be able to go to Amazon.com or some other um, second-hand book-selling environment to purchase books themselves rather than getting them from Athabasca University in the traditional way. Students have been quite clear they don't want to see us move forward in this project until we can guarantee that um, we have provided for students to choose the method of their learning. It's a very interesting um, uh, topic that we could talk about for days, but um, they've been clear and they've made their voices heard. The lack, as I indicated before, the lack of re cost reduction for the student um, is, has just been a, a, a real problem for us. It was not the right decision to not reduce the learning resources fee, at least in a symbolic way, to indicate that we were hearing the, uh, the feedback right from the beginning. There are some commu uh, communication um, difficulties for some people. Others said there were no difficulties whatsoever. And one thing we've learned is that people don't always read when, uh, when send them to a website. They don't always read the instructions in their course manual. It's actually not just students who don't always read. Staff and faculty don't always read either. And so um, extra communication is always necessary. 
Um, there were some delays in opening some courses because of the negotiation of the contracts with the, the publishers, but we don't see that as a major factor to worry about going forward. And there were some complaints in some areas about the performance, the technical performance of Vital Source. As a platform, it was very stable. It went down over the course of the last 18 months no more than three or four times, which is a pretty good rate. Um, I think our university systems probably go down more often than that. So as far as that goes, um, the performance was pretty good. But there were some quali quality issues in some uh, in some of the files that they received. And then the impossibility, the, le the, the restriction put on printing was also considered to be a major problem. These are some of the principal uh, benefits that we found for the university so far. We actually did save a lot of money, more than a million dollars um, last fiscal year uh, as a result of this initiative. That was a good thing. Um, uh, because that was part of the uh, reason for doing the project. Um, the uh, adoption of a, new, uh, of a new technology is always a part of what Athabasca is about. And so people feel that that, that experiment, if you wish, has, has really done us some good favors in terms of being the only university to do this so far. The um, management of um, uh, digital rights was well handled, and we learned a lot about how to negotiate with publishers. Um, uh, having single sign-on to the, I didn't mention this before, but having single sign-on to the textbook through Moodle was a very effective way of getting students ongoing and uh, continuous access to their textbook. And um, the experience with Vital Source, as I've said, was extremely good in spite of a few individual difficulties. Um, everybody pointed to the usefulness and, uh, of our website and of the social networking conversation that we had. So there's a few of the uh, larger scale um, results that we've seen so far. And uh, that actually comes to the end of my story. I hope that there are some questions, and I hope this has been uh, valuable for you in some way. Merci. Uh, so you, you talked basically about uh, the, the data that publishers have about what learners do with the text. And what I'm wondering if there's been a conversation with the publishers and learners about the use of that data by the publishers themselves and the transparency that should come with that. Donc en français, euh, vous avez parlé euh, de, des données qui sont disponibles par euh, les maisons d'édition sur euh, l'utilisation des livres par les apprenants. Et j'aimerais savoir s'il y a une conversation qui a eu lieu avec les, les éditeurs et avec les, les apprenants euh, sur l'utilisation de ces données et sur la transparence qui est nécessaire euh, dans un tel cas. Uh, thank you for the question. I think you're talking about the privacy of uh, individual student behaviors, and I can say that we did a uh, what we call a privacy impact assessment for this project. Um, our contracts with the individual publishers uh, clearly stipulated that they are not allowed to use the data for any purpose whatsoever without our permission, that is the university's permission. And our explanation of that with the students was that um, we would only use aggregate information for the purpose of understanding the features, the teaching and learning features of these uh, learning resources. Um, and so nothing can be identified to individual students. We haven't actually received anything from the publishers yet or from Vital Source. We think that our restrictions and conditions on them have made it difficult for them to, un, uh, to do the kind of data analysis that we would like them to provide us with. But we ap appreciate that it takes time for them to work within the guidelines. Alberta's uh, privacy laws are extremely stringent. 
as I know they are in Quebec, and so we have been very attentive to this all along. Um, our relationships with the publishers, I should say, we're at the vice presidential level. We do have confidence that the vice presidents of these four companies um, are, are taking our uh, constraints and conditions into consideration in their work. I hope that was what you were looking for. Donc, pour traduire, résumer un petit peu la réponse de Madame Ives, euh, elle dit qu'ils ont fait une étude de, de l'impact sur la, sur la confidentialité des données qui avaient été recueillies auprès des étudiants, puis que c'était surtout pour des, des questions éducatives et pas, ça ne pouvait pas être retracé à des étudiants en particulier. Euh, puis, elle disait aussi que les relations avec les éditeurs se faisaient vraiment un, un haut niveau là, euh, des cadres, au niveau des, du vice-président. Donc, c'était plus. Euh, donc, il y avait une, une bonne confiance euh, à ce niveau-là. C'est sûr qu'il aurait voulu plus euh, de détails euh, sur ce que les étudiants faisaient avec leurs ressources, euh, euh, leurs outils d'apprentissage. Euh, puis, ça, ces données-là n'étaient pas nécessairement très euh, disponibles. Euh, mais je pense que j'ai fait le tour de la question à peu près. <rire> en français, en fait, j'ai rencontré Rory McGrill de Athabasca University qui, lui, travaille beaucoup pour euh, les ressources libres en éducation. Et le gouvernement albertain, en fait, a investi 2 millions là-dedans. Et puis, je me demande comment la e Initiative peut coexister, en fait, avec euh, les ressources libres en éducation. <rire> Good question. Bonne question. Um, So the $2 million dollars is not yet available for open educational resources. The call for letters of intent just came out last week. Rory has been involved in trying to uh, in, encourage Athabasca University faculty to move into open educational resources for some time, as you will know if you know him. Um, we have been on the course design side encouraging the use of open educational resources for a long time. And it is Rory's position that we are being held hostage by the publishers. And I think we would agree with that. Having said that, with 900 courses uh, and faculty who have the right to choose whatever learning resources they want for their courses as a matter of uh, disciplinary expertise and academic freedom, we can't do every, we can't move everything to open educational resources um, all at once. We think. Uh, I, I guess I would say that this uh, pilot project has uh, shown clear indication to us that we should be moving faster away from the publishers. Um, but I wouldn't say that in all audiences, uh, in all environments. Um, our relationships with the publishers have been very good. I, I don't want to say that they weren't. And we have done some good things with this project for our students. But it doesn't go far enough. Donc, euh, pour résumer, euh, Mme Lynch disait que euh, tout d'abord, le 2 millions n'est pas euh, disponible présentement. L'annonce a été faite, je pense, la semaine dernière ou un truc comme ça. Euh, donc, pour ce qui est euh, des ressources euh, libres, elles euh, ne sont pas tout à fait euh, prêts encore à être présentées. Et. Euh, mais euh, c'est sûr que le, la position de M. McGreal, c'était qu'on était quand même pris au, en otage par les éditeurs, puis, euh, puis Mme Lynch n'est pas plus d'accord avec ça. Euh, mais par contre, elle ne peut pas dire non plus qu'ils n'ont pas des bonnes relations avec leurs éditeurs. Euh, ils ont fait des bonnes choses pour les étudiants de l'Université de Nebraska et. Euh, qui ont euh, eu des bonnes relations, puis tout ça. Euh, L'autre chose, c'est qu'ils ne peuvent pas tout euh, transférer vers euh, les ressources libres euh, en éducation euh, pour les 900 cours qu'ils offrent euh, là-bas. Donc, tout ne peut pas fait, être fait en même temps. Puis, il y a aussi la question que le corps professoral euh, doit pouvoir décider des, euh, des ressources qu'ils utilisent dans leur classe et euh, pour enseigner. Euh, pour faire suite, est-ce qu'il y a des cours qui sont euh, créés entièrement 
par les équipes d'enseignants, sans l'aide des maisons d'édition, s'il y en a, elle a fait pas fonctionner. Alors, il n'y en a pas du tout. Il n'y en a pas du tout. Alors, nous avons une politique de développement de cours qui demande le, le travail d'équipe et qui identifie les différents processus qui sont nécessaires dans le, dans le, dans le développement de C'est-à-dire, le, le, le professeur est le chef de l'équipe, euh, mais il ne peut pas travailler euh, Ce n'est pas le même, ça c'est surtout pour les cours euh, au niveau euh, euh, undergraduate courses, follow this process. So to be clear, a faculty member at the graduate level, masters, not masters so much, but certainly doctorate, um, has more control uh, over developing a course on their own. But Faculty do not have access to the learning management system themselves without the technical support. Um, and so they still require some part of a team, even at the, even at the highest level. That's right. So, the answer was So the publishing companies are uh, involved in every uh, aspect of the, every course, every course development uh, process. No, 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 no. Um, not the publishing company at all. No, there's a public, what we would call a course development team. Publishing company is is only a resource. Um, if, if a professor decides to use a, a textbook from a particular publisher. So uh, maybe a, a peu de confusion avec le terme de, de édition, publication, it's not the publishing company, they have no business in our teaching and learning environment. Um, uh, professor chooses the learning resources in, in collaboration with the designer, the professor pedagogique, and then they create content and exercises and activities and support and assessments um, outside of, or, or together with the rest of the team. The publisher has no involvement in that at all. Donc, l'éditeur, la compagnie, la maison d'édition n'a pas de... C'est un fournisseur, simplement. C'est l'équipe de conception est à l'université fait le lien un peu entre les ressources fournies à l'université et euh, l'équipe de conception euh, aide le, le, le professeur à construire son cours. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Hai. Thank you for being with us uh, so early this morning, considering it's not even nine on uh, your side. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, we may applause you. <laughs> Juste un, un mot final, je voulais vous dire que c'est la première fois que je fais une présentation sur ce projet à l'extérieur de l'université. So, je voulais vous remercier pour l'opportunité, pour l'occasion de le faire. Ça, ça me donne l'occasion d'y de, de, penser euh, un peu de, de nos points de vue et je vous remercie. Merci à vous.